Welcome to Association Chat. You have made it. You made it to the right spot. This is your online discussion where we warm ourselves by the virtual fire, welcoming thought leaders and trailblazers alike to join up in this online home for the community. I'm the host of Association Chat, Kiki Letalien, and today's nonprofit business model relies so heavily on meetings and events, it's impossible to discount, right? We know that whether it's commitment to cause, to content, to community, we, we know that there's a heavy connection between value proposition for an association and the events that it produces. So oftentimes we find out that uh, a lot of the interest that comes into this event creation and event design is tied directly to how successful it can be business-wise and how successful it can be at connecting members and attendees and really all stakeholders. But what happens when attendance begins to slide? What happens when the value in the value proposition doesn't seem to be what it used to be? Can event design save your conference? Well, Rude Jansen is an events industry powerhouse. I'm lucky to have met Rude a long time ago. And over the years, we've run in the same circles. And he is a, he is a thought leader and a trailblazer. You may have already seen his work, as a matter of fact, if you've looked through tools like Miro or Mural and discovered a design tool called the Event Model Canvas. Um, I actually had heard him talk about the event model canvas and event design before, and but somehow had had sort of forgotten about it and then was going through mural and I'm like, oh, the event model canvas, my good friend Rude helped co-design co that. So he's an international speaker, facilitator and designer of high stakes conferences and events. He's also the author of the event design handbook and Design to Change, and he serves as a co-founder of Event Design Collective. He also helps organizations innovate by thinking differently based on functional, social, and technological advancements using business and event model innovation. He's like the best person I could have on for this topic. Welcome, Rude. I'm so glad you're here. Hi, Kiki. Thanks for having me. This is really good. Good to uh, yeah. get to hang out with you a little bit. I know it's it's the time to do it. Like I, I can't believe I don't think that you've been on a association chat before, or if you have, it's been a long yeah. time ago. Yeah. So I'm glad that we're able to do this. And I think that you know things have really they have changed dramatically over the past few years. So maybe it's good mm -hmm. that you haven't been on before because now is a time where things are truly they truly are different. You know, because of technology, because of the way things have progressed. Um, I think when we talk about event design today, um, it's it's definitely a nuanced and complex conversation. So what I wanted to do is maybe have you tell a story and tell us a little bit about um, this idea, how the event model canvas came to be, uh, the collaboration with an association in particular, uh, the Internet Society, um, how that all took place and help catch us up. So for those who are watching or listening who yeah. don't know the story, they get an idea about, about this event model canvas. Absolutely. Thank you, Kiki. Um, mm -hmm. Funnily enough, the first time I ran into the concept of a mental model and single pagers to help groups of people think about a specific challenge was when I was on the International Board of Directors for MPI. Um, so volunteering on an association, being on boards really helped me understand um, the complexity of how contributing to your profession can actually help you grow yourself, right? So um, fast forward to 2022, you know, that was back in 2010 at the World <laughs> Education Congress in Vancouver. I, I remember that. Um, Alex Osterwalder, who created the business model canvas, came into uh, the board and helped us at the time when he had just launched his business model canvas, uh, think about how the association created value in itself, right? To the volunteers, to the different stakeholders, sponsors, uh, board members, you know, whoever you might kind of categorize and people that have power and interest over achieving the overarching aim. So mm -hmm. uh, we started working through that quite a bit and 
both my colleague Lucas and I were very interested in the simplicity or the yeah what what looked simple, but to get to the simple, you have to go to the complex. Um, and it really kind of tickled our brain for a while. And one of the things that we kept hearing and that I've, I'm still hearing <laughs> is this idea that people want to get a seat at the table. People want to contribute to the strategy. Everybody's full of those words. It's on the tip of their tongue all the time without really having an opportunity or a, a way to put their finger on where innovation is happening or what it actually means in practice when you talk about it as a group of people. Mm -hmm. um, we also noticed that over time, that dialogue hasn't really changed a lot, right? I remember that those conversations were happening, you know, 25 years ago, and they're still happening today. But what's really the delta, right? What's really the change that's happened, except for uh, the fact that out of the frustration of the fact that there are some excellent events, right, which I credit and have inspired me to really fall in love with events and how they're created. But we also have this mass of, let's say, mediocre at best events that clutter our time and space. And then we've got probably even more events that are a complete waste of time, a waste of resources. Um, and to me, a waste of time is a real cardinal sin, right? I mean, we have very mm -hmm. limited time, we have very limited resources. So when that's the case, you can do two things about it. You can complain about it or you can do something about it. And so uh, Wolf Riss and I, you know, rolled up our sleeves and we got to work and at an event that Alex was hosting called the Business Design Summit in Berlin 2013, we'd already done quite a bit of thinking about how could you enable a team of people to put their brain power together to use design thinking applied to the creation process of events because the way we create events is broken or was broken, uh, or maybe it never even existed, right? People yeah. were just, you know, Ooh, coffee, yeah, right. <laughs> oh, event, right? Or, right, right. All these things. We have processes for everything in business, whether it's accounting or investment or you know, mm -hmm. website building, or there's a process for everything, right? Except for events, or at least that was the case yeah. for designing events. Um, yet we have this whole sophisticated supply chain of people that are able to deliver events and deliver them quite proficiently. It's amazing how the supply chain can miraculously interpret what is in the prefrontal cortex of the event owner's brain when they say, oh, we should do this event and this is kind of what I had in mind. And they turn it into an RFP that all of a sudden lists, you know, seats and square meterage or square feet in your part of the world. Yeah. Um, where all of a sudden people just have to interpret whatever it is that the story is in the head of the event owner into whatever that thing could become when this army of people have to put together all of these efforts to create that environment, right? With multiple stakeholders. So it's a fairly sticky and difficult subject. But one of the things that kept fascinating us was this question, oh, which is How does your event create value? How yeah. does your event create value, right? Because around the board yeah. table, this conversation goes on perpetually. And now recently we've added this little thing that we haven't printed yet, but it's called to craft, quantify, and celebrate progress over time. To right? craft, so how... quantify, celebrate. I, I'm just reading this out. To craft, quantify, quantify, celebrate progress over, over time. time. Okay. So every organization's leader, right, um, has this concern about reaching the overarching aim of their organization, right? I was listening to some of the guests on your podcast and, um, um, you know, your guests perpetually address that question, right? Um, yeah. It's something that is on the top of the mind of every leader, yet they want to have a kind of give the team a mandate to go and work on that effectively. And events are really cool uh, Petri dishes that over time allow you to kind of measure the progress or craft it or quantify it or celebrate it or all of the above, right? Mm -hmm. Yet, you have to be able to articulate how your event creates value for the different stakeholders because it can be very different types of values. And so what we've done is purposely kind of um, created the, you know, the, the playbook or the game book um, on how to design that with a team of people by not falling in love with the solution, but by falling in love with the problem, right? 
Mm -hmm. So you have to allow your team to roll enough time in the problem, apply design thinking. Um, and we systemize that. We you know, literally crafted it up. There's a book called the Event Design Handbook that we put out in 2016. Uh, and MPI was generous enough to give us the Thought Leadership Summit as a platform to kind of try and test that. And also the World Education Congress, we were able to show this first iteration of what we then called the event model canvas. In the meantime, we've taken away a word. It's called the event canvas. Mm -hmm. It's the art of leaving away, right? <laughs> um, right? And the event canvas was really the mental model, like the sheet music, you know, what sheet music is to music, the event canvas could be that for events, right? So mm -hmm. it's 14 different building blocks and three elements that articulate the change of the behavior, which is the thing that creates value, the frame within which the design should fit. And the frame is things like the commitment and time and the expected return and, you know, the costs and the revenues and the jobs that gets done and the promise of the events, right? Which is like the gift that you unwrap and you go, oh, here's the event, right? And inside the gift is what you, what that's the value proposition for that specific stakeholder. Um, if you look closely at the event canvas, and I encourage people to download the event canvas at eventcanvas.org, um, it's incredible how a very generous community of people, after we created the canvas, published it under Creative Commons uh, back in 2014. Uh, actually, we launched it on the 14th of February, 2014. It was our little love baby to the world. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that love baby. We're really happy that you did. <laughs> well, you know, I wouldn't mention exactly how, you know, Will Dennis and I um, um, spent a lot of time to create this single piece of paper. Mm -hmm. Creating a mental model that's, that stands the test of time is not that easy, um, as we found out the hard way. But we published it under Creative Commons, so anybody could download it and use it, and that went like wildfire. And so we thought we were done when we created the event canvas in 2014. And we were ready to walk away when people started asking us questions, like, what's the order and sequence of the way you answer the questions or which box do I fill first? And people, people want instruction, right? Especially yeah. people in the events industry, because they're used to like getting it perfect, right? They want to get everything perfect. And the thing about design is it's not perfect. It's imperfect. It's messy. And so you have to be really okay with being messy. So there was a lot of unlearning that had to be done for people that went through that. And so we added questions to the event canvas. Uh, and then people came back to us and said, well, what's the order and sequence of the questions? And, you know, should I use a team or uh, like all these questions about the use? And over time, we had literally tried ourselves. What's the best way of using it? And so when people asked us, where's the book? We actually said, you know, there is we're not going to create a book because the first thing that they wanted was kind of a guide. Right? It's like, mm -hmm. what are the steps? How do I write down the steps? So this is like the fourth iteration. It's called the Event Design Facilitation Kit. And it does all those four little steps, you know. And so people can now buy this little box which has all the ingredients and roll cards. So you have a facilitator of the process and you've got a jester and a blah, blah reducer and um, an idea generator and you've got a recorder. And so you have roles in the team that designs. And when you design together um, with a group of seven people, that are very diverse in background in how they look at the different stakeholders, et cetera, et cetera. The richness of combining the brain power of seven people is absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. right? And I think this is where um, facilitating people through a process that's proven to work over time is a really powerful way to do the thing that we all want to do, right? Which is um, the event canvas when we originally created it, you know, now we found out is for anyone that needs to get everyone on the same page. Yeah. And so the canvas is really just a one pager to get the narrative of a group of people who collaborate to consciously think about what this thing ha uh, does or what the event should be doing for each of the different stakeholders, because the stakeholders can be very diverse in their thinking and you peel the problem apart. And so that's how the canvas came to be. Then we started applying it and we developed the methodology around it. Um, We've added a number of different supporting canvases in, the, in that process. Um, and through case studies, through using this in practice, we developed you know, some pretty interesting events, I think, that are written up in this event design handbook. By the way, if people download the canvas, they get the first half of the book for free. That was inspired by uh, um, Alex Osterwalder. 
uh, because this part, after you read that, you probably want to buy the other part, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. It's also, right. it's also how, um, you know, the, the power, you cannot own a process, but you, you can inspire for the application. And so when we were writing this book, the first story we wrote was over lunch, we challenged ourselves, how would we explain this to our grandmother or our seven year olds? Right? Mm -hmm. So there's a story in the book about Elsa and Elsa is uh, Dennis's daughter. Dennis is the guy that makes all these really cool drawings. When we talk complex stuff, he just hits it over the head with a hammer and turns <laughs> it into a picture. And, you know, if a picture is worth a thousand words, then the prototypes in event designing are worth a thousand meetings. And mm -hmm. people hate the meetings about meetings. So we get rid of the meetings about meetings, and then you end up with very simple stories. But to make a story simple and applicable is not that easy. It's a little complex. You need a group of brains to do that together. And so that's how we yeah, created the event canvas, how people are using it. And then people were asking us, can you train us how to do that? Mm -hmm. And so, well, because when we did it, it looked really easy. And we thought it was really easy because we just kept focusing on only that thing. And then we created something called the Event Design Certificate Program, uh, which is now in five levels. Um, it's wow. become a bit of a monster, right? There's yeah, I was going to say, I, I hadn't, <laughs> like, I didn't realize it had grown so much. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So now there's a community of about, I would say, 25,000 people that are using this you know, um, across the globe in 17 languages, it's been translated in by the community. Yeah. Um, we have, you know, so it's currently the, the, the first level, the EDC YP young professionals level is actually being taught currently at 25 different universities across the planet. So we're super excited about that. We've got all these cohorts starting again now, you know, so today I was on the line with university in Switzerland and in Thailand and you know, uh, Indiana University, uh, Purdue uh, is, is, is bringing this uh, to their programs. And it's super exciting to see students in bachelor's degree, even associate's degree, master's degree programs, learning about this from the get go. Mm -hmm. I think that's super encouraging. The adoption at first was by some of the pinnacle events, right? So the International Olympic Committee and the United Nations and the Internet Society, you were mentioning that some of the events that were very high stakes were very quick to find us, which surprised us in a good way. So we were able to work with them and test our, you know, test our model and, and get help them help their stakeholders. Um, and by developing a training that's robust and can be translated, so now we have 12 people in different languages doing this across different countries. And we've got all these fantastic facilitators in universities who are certified event designers that have taken this third level of training. And now that group is, we're going into the 38th cohort you know, and since its inception in 2015. So there's 500 certified event designers now wow. and 3,500 trained practitioners. So this thing has kind of caught fire. So it was like a little side project that turned into a bit of a monster, really. Yeah. I feel, are you, I, mean, I love doing this. I mean, talk <laughs> about legacy. When people, when people talk about legacy, you can actually look at that and say, this is, this is something that will outlive you. It's, it's like going to live beyond beyond rude jan i mean i want you to live forever rude but like you know i it's it's got longevity there this is a legacy type of a an item that is impacting people a tool that's impacting people worldwide um across all, all languages and is actually giving people a process by which they can they can design an event that is successful and meaningful but i want i wanted to ask you a question about what you've seen over time, because you've seen so many people go through, um, you've heard about all kinds of different events. You have taught people how to design events. You've surely got a million different examples of things that are done really well and things that are done poorly, events that are done poorly. Um, I wanted to ask you if you've noticed if anything has changed from our, our, pandemic from um the times of covid what have you noticed that's that's maybe changed or not changed since uh we dealt with this because when you created this when you helped create this this mm -hmm. this we didn't have issues where we were battling a virus where people you know had to suddenly not be able to meet in person and then technology stepped in to the degree that it did so um, what would you say has changed or not changed since COVID was introduced? 
Well, I'd, I'd ask everyone that's kind of watching this to, to think about their own priorities when it comes to events and event design, right? Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes um, the context can change in which things happen and you think everything's fine, right? Um, but you end up in tumbleweed because a circumstance changes, right? And I think that's something that um, 2019, the events industry was on fire, right? Yeah. Uh, yet 10 years before, you know, there was a financial crisis and, you know, a number of changes that happened at the time. Uh, out of those changes come big changes, right? So at the end of this month, I'm going to go to C2 in Montreal. That's an event mm -hmm. that came out of the financial crisis, right? Yeah. But how does it come out of the COVID change that impacted the world even more significantly than the financial crisis, I would say. Um, what's very exciting about what, what we do, uh, Kiki, which is the hardest thing we do is for people to claim time to think about their event design with a team of people. That's the hardest thing we have to teach people. And over time, because the process is so relatively easy to learn and to become a facilitator is very exciting we actually created a problem that people fell in love with the process. Mm -hmm. right? People are very, people are very geek, geeky, not geeky. They're very geeky. About, <laughs> sorry, that's a geeky, geeky, geeky. I'm sorry. <laughs> they're, they're geeky, geeky about the process. And all they can do is like, you know, they're learning about the process. They get very excited about it. It's like, oh, well, I now know this thing and I can design events and I've got this, you know, facilitation kit and I've got, let's get the team together. And, and to be honest, your event owner, couldn't care less what process you used. When I go to my accountant, I don't get excited by the bookkeeping he does, right? Mm -hmm. All I want is the profit and loss statement, the balance sheet, and I want it to be correct. So I don't get in trouble with the tax man. Well, the yeah. same thing with events. That's the bad news for everybody that's kind of geeky about event design. It's not about the process of event design. It's important to have a really good one that's trustworthy. But at the end of the day, it's all about the outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so that was the reason why, you know, and I'll get back to your question in a minute. What did people, what did COVID give us? Well, it gave us like the perfect event. COVID okay. is probably the most perfect <laughs> event I've ever seen on the planet. <laughs> it's, right? been, it's been effective. Well, let's say one thing. So if your measure of success is, does it change behavior? Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Right? And the second one is, does it change behavior for the various uh, stakeholders. Now, the only thing that's missing there, and that's why we updated our definition of event design from this book to this book, is that it should be in the desired direction of change, right? Mm -hmm. Events can change behavior and create value, but if it's not in the desired direction of change, your narrative could end up somewhere else, right? It's mm -hmm. kind of like Alice in Wonderland. We go down a rabbit hole, spend a lot of time in it, and we come back out and nothing has changed. Well, that's yeah. not the perfect hero's journey you want to design for. And that's what COVID did, in, in fact, is it, it gave us and it gave many people time to think about what it is that they were doing and how they were doing it. Um, Mural has told us before that we're probably one of the most expensive onboarding tools, but also the most effective one for their systems. Oh, Before 2019, <laughs> right, we, we, we've been working yeah. with them since these guys sat around the, uh, the kitchen table in Buenos Aires and, you know, built this as a side project because they were frustrated game designers when they traveled, couldn't look at the phone boards that were sitting in their, in their studio, right? Mm -hmm. And so they built these whiteboards so that when they were traveling, they could still kind of build the words, worlds on the gaming. Well, I the never knew that that was the, I never knew that that was the background for that. Yeah. yeah, yeah that's yeah. so cool. Anyway, they sold their company to, 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 to or they sold the gaming business to, to Disney. And then they, they developed this because it was something that other people needed to collaborate whilst they were in geographically displaced spaces. Mm -hmm. right? And the ability to use something visual, interactive, you see other people working at the same time, it becomes collaborative. And that's a very powerful tool that we've been using for a long time. But before COVID, we had to spend obscene amounts of time to explain to people how to use Zoom and to how to use Mural before we could start the effective process of teaching them how to do event design or facilitating the process. Um, after COVID, those two you know, behaviors that we had to first uh, teach as a skill or as a knowledge um, were basically sorted, right? Or for most people anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and what's interesting is that 
COVID was the perfect event in terms of massive behavior change at scale, right? Um, but it, you know, it also created a lot of collateral damage and it, and it was a very painful situation because the behaviors that were changed um, were not intended to go to have that kind of behavior change. And I think this is what we can learn from COVID is that it gave us a lot of time to think about stuff. Uh, finally, people got their studios sorted and bought proper lighting, cameras, microphones, so that when we are online together, we can actually enjoy the quality of the sound that we're using and all the other stuff. Um, but that's a complete byproduct. Um, I think it's opened up our brains to different ways of collaborating between people. Mm -hmm. um, and what we did is we had a chance to, to write a book, right? The Design to Change book is not our ode to COVID, but it's, it's, it's actually a, a summation of the learnings out of the, I would say, 500 plus conversations we've had with certified event designers. Because we've, you know, Will and I personally make a point of training the certified event designers uh, and getting to know all of them and having seen their frustration in how difficult it is to have the conversation with the event owners. But now we bottled up how that conversation can happen and what the insights are and what the perspectives are and how to deal with that. Uh, and that turned into this book. But the book is actually an outcome of an event, right? So the EDC Mastermind, the level five, um, which was done online for the last two years, was actually the testing ground for the content without those that were participating knew that that was the case. We sent them a little surprise after the second day, which was an alpha version personalized of the book in PDF. And oh, then wow. weeks later, we got um, a printed copy to them, right, by mail. Um, and they then, the EDC Mastermind helped us to kind of perfect, or not perfect, but improve the content by challenging it through an event. Oh. That is so great though, because I mean, talk about people feeling like, so you're, you're incorporating surprise, you know, you're like giving them a surprise. There's value in the, the work that they've done. So this is all process. I'm just thinking about how amazing that is because how many times do we get together and, and uh, have an amazing group of people who are super smart working towards something and all of these, this good these answers and problem solving just yeah. sort of we're hoping that somebody holds on to it and takes a little bit of it down downstream and and you were actually doing all of this so that it was feeding them in in the process itself in yeah. the event itself well the That's thing so is cool. at the end of the day you know and and just to kind of give you an idea of like when when you get people together in a studio right so i'm just putting the studio here for a second mm -hmm. like they get geeky and they go through a process that's quite linear, which people like, you know, when they have something to hang on to, like the canvas, it allows them to really like point to where the innovation is. This is where the change is. Here's where the move is for that stakeholder. And it becomes very specific, right? Like, like a conductor that uh, has sheet music and from the sheet music can actually then can kind of interpret what is on the intended story. I mean, events are like that, right? They're, Events are works of art, but you frame them, and that's why it becomes design, right? Design is framed art. And so if you can frame that problem and you can kind of be comfortable with this kind of situation where instead of putting duct tape and sticky tape on a leaking faucet, you just stop it for a minute and you think and you take the fuzzy situation and you start decoding how it works, you can then actually make sense of the situation in a very different way. Um, so what you're doing is technically this is you're, you're you're taking kind of the spaghetti that's in the head of all of the stakeholders. You know, and this is the, the famous squiggle. Yeah. You pull out one of the strings of spaghetti and you start working towards this event and it should contribute to the overarching aim of the organization. But really what you're doing is creating kind of a, a system to get, you know, to get the team to consciously design and then have a committed team with an event story that's super simple to replicate on a single piece of paper. Um, which then allows the organizations to get some kind of a perspective, right? This is what we call our perspectives poster. And it's really about, you know, at the top level here, you kind of have this, this situation where the event owner and the event designer talk together about what this event should do for the organization. And then the team can actually go and design that content, right, together. It's really hard to do this in mirror image. I'm kind of I know. Like, I'm very impressed. I was like, oh, then, you can tell that you've done this so many times because it's like you're doing <laughs> it's, really it's well. It's still very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, what you get is the anatomy of the event, right? And yeah. you can ask your leaders to actually say, 
how big is the change that you want to design for? Is it a small pebble in a bucket? Or are you ready to push in a boulder and create a big ripple? Right. And I think this is where, at the end of the day, um, the reason we wrote these books was just to get it out of our system and to get other people to do the same thing, to be mm -hmm. able to, I mean, our, our purpose is literally to enable others to do what we do, right? It gives us a great sense of pride when we can step back and watch them do it and cheer them on. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody, uh, Kiki, do you know who created the sheet music for music? No, I don't actually. Nobody does. Yeah, yeah I purpose, don't. Right? Yeah. It's not about ego. Right. Some people design egocentric events, right? Events could serve certain egos. Mm. You, can them to, you can design for that to happen. Right. Yeah. But by having a, a diverse group of people think about a challenge and come up with what would be the best way of changing these three behaviors from entry to exit. What are the three things that are in the middle that need to change? And then how can we best do that? And that becomes the the rubric or the lens you look through when you decide whether an idea is good, bad, or mediocre, because it's not a good idea because it came from the CEO or the board chair. Mm -hmm. right? We put ideas in a quarantine. We lock them up for a significant amount of time. And the quarantine existed way before COVID, just so you know. Yeah. Um, but the ideas get decontaminated before you start considering them for your event. That's the whole point. Who are our, our Mozart and Beethovens of event design today? Um, the good thing is it's not single people, mm -hmm. it's groups of people. And that's why uh, I would ask you the same question. Do you know who the president is of, of Switzerland? No. <laughs> no idea, right? I sometimes even don't remember because they change every year. They don't yeah. allow egos to get in the way, right? It's a cabinet yeah. of seven and the seven people change roles every year so that nobody comes, you know, attaches their ego to a role, which is one of the big mistakes that we do in anything that, creates leadership or power. Mm, mm -hmm. So we redistribute the power to a group of people who think together about something. And I got to say, there's teams that create stellar events, but those teams keep changing and, and yeah. morphing, right. And that's, that's why the events are dynamic. That's so why the, the designs are dynamic. So I'm thinking, okay, we've got our, our sheet music that helps to create um, the beautiful, you know, outcomes, the beautiful events that we're creating. We don't have Mozart's or Beethoven's. We have teams that make this happen. So our composers are groups of composers that are collaborating, collaborating to make it happen. So maybe I should be asking about the compositions. So what are some of the great events that are out there that are some of the great compositions that play very well? Yeah, I think the ones that excite us are the ones that are delivering on the change that the organization needs it to do. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, some of the ones that we're very excited about is um, a recent one actually by one of our certified event designers who knocked on our door first when their event in Bangkok got canceled because of COVID. Mm -hmm. And um, although it was a yearly recurring event, this organization turned 20 years old in that specific year when this event was due to happen. Oh. Uh, it was a very young organization with a young event, right? Uh, yeah. The event only took place 15 years, but it was a very significant event to, to celebrate the progress of the community. Um, the organization is the Wikimedia Foundation, right? Who, who the creators of Wiki, Wikipedia and yes. the 13 different activities that they have across the planet. Um, and when they turned around and saw what behavior or what no longer happened because the organizations or because the event was not happening, right? You can start feeling the pain the longer you are not having an event. So I yeah. think that's the way COVID gave us a gift as well, is it, it very blatantly laid bare um, the essence of what the event did not do or did do. Right? So that became super clear. You can put it on a couple of post-its and just identify it. And if you bring the community together that knows about the history of an event and you go through that process and you allow them to then take the essence of what the event is supposed to do in relation to the larger overarching aim. In this case, they have a movement strategy for 2030. You know, their thing is spelled out where they want to end up seven years from today. Um, they had then had a very clear kind of pathway to say, okay, what does this event look like in 2027? We've got four years to get there. 
what are the iterations of change we're going to design for and what are the new design restrictions, right? And one of them for those two years was we are not allowed to gather by law, right? We are not right. allowed to do X, Y, Z. So it's very simple. So it's, it's, it's an exercise of deduction. And the more restrictions you have, the more creative your team becomes, right? So the design frame is a very important ingredient in your design, um, in creating your design prototypes. So it's really exciting to see like, okay, so we work with the team to do that. They put on their first event and then their lead strategist, Joel Latang, came, you know, came to our program because we said, we're, we're only going to help you once. Next time you're going to have to do it with your team and you're going to have to lead it. So he came to our program. And this year is Wikimedia. You can look it up because Wikimedia publishes everything about their events, right? On okay. just Wikipedia, uh, Wikimania. Sorry, that's the name of the event. Um, we did some podcasts as well about it. Happy to share those. Okay. But we talk about this this progress and change. Uh, but I was fascinated at how he was then equipping his team and bringing together volunteers to design this next iteration. And they just delivered it at the end of August. And this is no small feat, right? This event is highly complex and audiences with very specific needs in multiple languages and cultures. And, and to me, like seeing those types of events come to life mm -hmm. or seeing what, you know, the International Olympic Committee now has done for the opening of the Paris Olympics, you know, not build a stadium, but use the Seine as the scene, right? So the river becomes the opening structure. Well, you can do that if you start thinking without your preset conceived notions of what, what it what it would be rinse and repeat, but if you allow yourselves to think within new boundaries. And so I think to cut a long story short, I mean there's so many examples we could give. Most of them are mm -hmm. proprietary, so we can't even share them, unfortunately. But mm -hmm. those that we can share, we put them on mural as well, right? So there's open rooms on mural that all of our users can access and they can inspire each other in what we like to call the IKEA library of event designs. Right? <laughs> you can go there and get a <laughs> <laughs> Wait, but you also get lost in IKEA sometimes. So, like, is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, that's part of their design, right? It's like they want, you know, you, what you time is it? Where and am you walk I? With a cupboard, right? It's, it's <laughs> or or you forget one screw, and then the bed turns into right, a cupboard, right? Because right? you didn't read the instructions properly. That's but it. At the end of the day, I think any team can design a good event, providing it has the right kind of briefing and it has the right and uh, structure to go through it systematically. Mm -hmm. And the whole art of this is that an event design or an event design process never leads to one solution. It always has multiple prototypes that come out the other end of the pipeline. So mm -hmm. you could do A, B, or C, or you could D, could do D, which is don't do the event, but then you're now able to articulate what behavior does not get changed as a result of not doing the event. And that's usually a pretty good point to start when you're talking to your event owner to be able to articulate that. Because not having the event is always in the back of their mind, right? Yeah. And during COVID, it, it was, was definitely on the top there. of their mind, right? Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. Because they weren't Absolutely. allowed to have the event, or you know, they it blocked and they had to redesign. So the gift COVID gave us was time to think, mm -hmm. time to experience something across the planet in very similar ways with a lot of fear and pain connected to it, which unfortunately is a rocket fuel for ambiguity, and ambiguity is the rocket fuel for creation. And I think what I'm seeing now is you were asking the question before. Yes, behaviors have dramatically changed of people. And the biggest behavior that scares me is the fact that many people forgot what it was like to go through COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Some people are pretending they can't, that, that just didn't happen. And, and they just pretend that the behaviors of all the people are the same, but they're not. Right. So we have to highly empathize with each of the stakeholders you have to really think about what it means for them from their perspective. You have to carry those stories and validate those stories. And anyone that makes assumptions about those behaviors, you can guarantee that they're going to end up somewhere else and not have the, the role of a trusted advisor, which at the end of the day, you know, to loop it back to where we began, we began with this idea that everybody wants a seat at the table. And I want to dispel that myth, at least on my behalf, is that I don't think a lot of people in this industry should want to have, um, and I'm talking for a minute about the events industry, right? So mm -hmm. associations use events as a vehicle of change. Um, but I think it's not about having a seat at the table as a designer, but being a trusted advisor to the people that have a mm -hmm. seat at the table, right? You don't even want a seat at the table because then you get muddled in the conversations that are happening on the table. 
you want to be the trusted advisor on the outside that can come in and at eye level challenge what's happening without having a stake at the table. That's what That's, good designers do. Yeah. yeah. That's fascinating. I mean, I, I'm just, there's so much, there's so much that you said in this amount. And I, I'm very aware that I have about five minutes to get more just insight from you, but I'm just, all of this is, you're so quotable, rude. I don't know how to say this. Um, okay. So, so. You've got a book. It's all in there. Don't worry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all the good stuff's in there. So, so Kiki, I, I wanted to ask you this question. If I can ask you a question for a second. Mm -hmm. I know we have five minutes, right? Yes. Um, our book, so the Design to Change book, which is elevating your ability to look and act beyond the now, starts with yes. one quote, which is a good conversation can change the direction, um, can shift the direction of change forever. Would you leave it to chance? Oh, I love that. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about, right? Yeah. If you leave an event to chance and whatever happens comes out, sometimes it could be fantastic by coincidence. Yeah. But the stakes are so high in, you, in most situations, especially now, right? I mean, we know that, you know, 70% um, attendance down over what has happened, you know, pre-COVID. Um, people are very critical on how they spend their time. So we're all designers of time and we've got to figure out how do we create time well invested instead of saving people time or wasting their time? You know, the way Joe Pine looks at time, or, you know, in the experience economy, that's that should be front center in the heads of any association executive is people's time is very limited. How do you design for the time they spend with you? And how is that then spent most effectively to change the behavior and the desired direction of change? And well, I think. Yeah, that inspired that. That's inspiring my next blog post. I think because that's that's. I mean, it's such a good question, but we should all be asking ourselves that. I think one thing that you commented that that you said before that I want to really highlight for people is it is it is uh, concerning that people some people have chosen to forget or maybe not even chosen, they just have forgotten mm. uh, this experience of going through COVID and what that meant for us and holding meetings and events and, and the impact that that had. And a lot of us, I, I understand psychologically, don't wanna think about this idea of it could happen again, but it's not even just about COVID. We see stuff with the climate change and yeah. what's happening with that. We see things with um, what's happening with war and with uh, changes with the supply chain and with travel disruptions and with um, just with our financial and, and economic climate. And there are so many different ways that things can become disrupted that I think the lessons that we've learned, we just cannot, we should not allow ourselves to forget so that we can grow and, and better adapt and respond to the challenges that we face that are lining up against us now and in the future. Yeah. And, and you know, um, you know, war, wars are events. You 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 mentioned them. They start with a bullet, but they end with conversations, right? So, yeah. how can you flip that model, right? How can you make <laughs> sure that, let's say, the conversations we're having are most effective, especially when they're happening at scale, when clusters of people that we can precondition or pre-filter to get somewhere, which I think is the power of associations, right? Mm -hmm. People have a common care. They want to talk about the stuff that they care about. That brings them together. That's the magnet. Mm -hmm. And then you add, you know, the oil and the glue to kind of bring those things together in the right order and sequence to make sure that those things gel at the right time. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, we have this saying that um, show me an organization's event and I'll tell you about their culture. Right. Mm -hmm. I can go to like you, you could go to any association event of any association, a sample it for even 15 minutes or three days or, or a week and you can decode the culture. And what do real leaders want to do is they want to, they want to um, they want to culture a culture over time, right? They 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 see what the current culture is, and there's enablers and blockers, and then there's a future kind of state that they wish to create. And events are the perfect measuring sticks, right? Like the, the blood samples of culture over time. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in our new book, in this one, we actually look at that quite closely. You know, where 
you can by design look at that through through a very specific lens. Right? So we have this image where um, you know you've got the events here at the bottom, right, which happen over time. Uh, you've got like the planning and all the stuff that happens with the events because they create culture over time. But at the end of the day, what you want is this conversation up here that the event owner wants to have, which is really only about the deltas of change over time. And you can look at the change that happens within the event from entry to exit over the two or three days. Or you can look at multiple events and the change that happens between the events, and then you can string them together. And that's really the instrument that leaders use, but they don't have a way to talk about it with their teams. And so we hope that with this, and we see that it works like that over multiple years, you are now able to design for culture in the future and the events become the pivotal moments of change, like the little Petri dishes of culture. So it's fascinating to do that stuff. Yeah. It is. I'm, I'm, I'm patting myself on the back for being able to um, look out to be able to have you uh, talk with you today and just have the chance to, to engage you with association chat audience, but selfishly also with me. <laughs> and so thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. If, there's, if there is one thing, one next step, best next step that an association executive could take after listening to our discussion today, yeah. Yeah. what do you think it would be? Um, I would say, ask yourself this question, right? Okay, let's see. How does your event create value? Yes. Not that you have the answer, but like if, if you want to craft, quantify and celebrate progress over time, a good place to start would be, you know, download what you have there. The event camera, mm -hmm. it's not going to cost you anything. Maybe look at the past event that you've had, because it's very easy to decode something in hindsight. You can see the behavior changes. You can actually document it very easily. And if you want an example uh, on our website, you'll find an example of C2, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go and do it again next, you know, in two weeks. Uh, you can see the 27, 2017 edition. You can see this edition decoded very simply using this canvas. And I would say equip your stakeholders with the ability to do that. So yeah. we do this, you know, for MPI all the time. Um, you know, we've designed as part of the EDC program, the event in Indianapolis that happened. And now at IMEX America on Smart Monday, we're going to design the World Education Congress 2027 destination unknown. And the community comes in and helps design it with us, right? Whilst you're at another event, you can design an event together. So I would say activate your teams. Don't never try to do this alone, right? It's not a solo sport. <laughs> Somebody pretends to be your star designer and comes in and does it for you, I would mistrust them, right? Yes. It's absolutely impossible. Or it's arrogant to think you know what other people know. And I think you have to put other people, you know, or in an orchestrated fashion to think and collaborate around what that is. But you need a process to do that. And then the outcomes are going to just, they're going to knock your, your top off. It is just absolutely stunning what people can do. All you have to do is put them together, give them some time, team and space, and off they go. Well, I, I just want to say thank you once again. You heard it here, folks. Um, you heard it here. Go to eventcanvas.org, connect, find out more about Rude, find out more about the event design, the event model canvas, now just event canvas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There we go. You know, we're streamlining we already. It. Yeah, simplify. We it. And, um, and, just keep learning and asking questions every day. Rude, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Kiki. This was an absolute delight to speak with you. And will we meet at IMAX America? I We might. We might. I'm still working out if I'm going to be there. But okay. I know all of the best people will be there. So I hope to be one of them. And if not there, then at the next uh, next opportunity. Yes, of Thanks course. So for else. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was our pleasure. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think? I mean, what an amazing, amazing interview. I have to say that Rude Jansen is just, he's so great to know, to talk to, wealth, wealth of knowledge. And if you do one thing, just go to eventcanvas.org and find out more, um, buy the book, buy the latest book, look into your event design, educate yourselves and just find out what you can do so that you can begin to create more and more value for that uh, event that you're creating that's so important to your associations. And like I said, 
keep asking questions to learn every day. And why? Why is that? Because as Joseph Campbell once said, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. Have a great rest of the week, everyone.